It's June 1st. Welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen. And welcome back, everyone. June's one of my favorite months. Is it? What do you love about June, Danielle? My son's birthday is in it. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. That's <laughs> yeah, awesome. I love it. And it's the beginning of summer and pools are usually open. So I enjoy it. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Oh, I wonder what's going to happen with that this year. Mine's open. Oh, it is. It sure is. I was there yesterday for an hour and I regret it because I didn't put on enough sunscreen. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were able to do that. Do they have rules about social distancing or anything? Yeah, there's some funny rules, but I think it's it's working well, though. There's never too many people at the pool. They've kept all the chairs six feet apart. And I mean, people are being very smart about it. So I felt good going. I wasn't too scared. <laughs> uh, awesome. Awesome. Well, Danielle, uh, I got some big news to share with you. and. Mm -hmm a big thank you that I want to give to our audience. The last episode of Crime After Crime has been our most successful yet, and we just hit 1 million listens for the past 12 months on the podcast. Wow. That's incredible. I was Isn't wondering that awesome? when that would happen. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just for the last 12 months. That doesn't yeah. include the shows from before. But on top of that, on Apple podcast charts, we're now holding steady in the top 50 of all US documentary charts. And several other countries, including Great Britain and Canada. Uh, and we're also on the list of top documentary podcasts at apple.com. They oh, have this wow. one. Yeah. yeah. You know, they have that big list that's kind of like, here's the ones that you should be listening to for the documentary topic. We're on that list. We can't do it without amazing viewers and listeners just like you. And of course, support from amazing sponsors just like Magellan TV. Looking for more great documentaries, Magellan TV is a streaming service founded by filmmakers with a passion for producing and curating the best documentary content out there. Shows on history, science, space, nature, and of course, true crime. It's all waiting for you on Magellan TV. Can a spouse use a parachute as a murder weapon? Check out Parachute Murder Plot and buckle up for one heck of a story. One of my favorites is Killer in the Family. It gives you a perspective not often seen as the family members discuss what they go through. Magellan TV works on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, iOS. You can watch it on your TV, laptop, or mobile device anytime, anywhere. With more than 2,000 documentaries and new content being added weekly, including 4K content at no additional cost, why wouldn't you give Magellan TV a try? And Crime After Crime viewers can try it for free. Visit try.magellantv.com forward slash crime after crime and you'll get a one month free trial. There's nothing to lose. Give Magellan TV a try for free and thank them for supporting Crime After Crime at the same time. Visit try.magellantv.com slash crime after crime today. Well, our subscriber numbers are doing good, but what about our voting numbers? Is the season of revenge back on track or will Danielle catch up and keep this race nose to nose? It's time for voting results with Danielle Hallen. This is when I need one of my jingles. I've got to find one. I need to pre-record one so we can enter it in. I'm telling you. Well, you guys, my favorite part, voting results on Twitter. I received 73% of the votes and John Bam. received 27%. That's a landslide. What did I do right? <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, it was that story. That story <clears throat> was amazing. I'm still waiting for the movie. I want to see that in a film. I'm telling you, oh, it's. I swear I say this every time. I end up finding these stories that are insane. I don't even know how I do it, but it's funny because I always think the same thing about your good stories. I'm like, how in the heck did you find that? <laughs> and, but it's always funny because we never stumble across those stories yeah, I ourselves know. when the other does like an insane one. Yeah. I don't I know. know what happens, but I, I think that's part of the magic of this show is yeah. just picking these topics. They're making us look in kind of different places yeah. and we're digging out just different types of stories. And even if you get one story that maybe isn't a knockout of the park, <clears throat> John's story from no, last episode. No, yours was insane. I went and told everyone about it after. <laughs> I was but like, you it, know what they did with this U-Haul? God. <laughs> even, even if it doesn't knock it out of the park, you still know that the other story is probably going to. And Danielle really showed that in this episode. What about YouTube, Danielle? YouTube was 78% of the votes for myself and 21% for John. But do you guys know what this means? 
I'm coming back. <laughs> it sure does. I caught up. I was nervous. I didn't think I would. Yeah. We are now tied yep. four to four. Thank you to the episode Shady Siblings. And mm-hmm. with that, this would be time for the cup exchange. Uh, Danielle is holding on to the cup. <laughs> And she's not handing it over. She (laughs) is holding it to her chest and it is disappearing out of the screen. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. No cup for John. Um, But I did have something and this is a little bit of a surprise for Danielle. You always do this? uh, (laughs) I got a package. Uh, I I told you earlier, I went to the post office today and I checked my P.O. box. Uh Um, So this nice card Mm -hmm. came here. It says, if only everyone were a little more like you. And it's for both of us. So there's a little, yeah, a little message I want to share with you here Uh, for John and Danielle. Thank you both for the amazing work you do for the victims and their families. I admire you and am inspired by you. I know it's heavy work and seeing the humor and light heartedness during crime after crime is so refreshing. I also sent a gift that will hopefully represent that for you both and always give you a smile when doing the heavy work. Always Jennifer Foote. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Yeah, that was incredibly sweet. That put a huge smile on my face. (laughs) And not only did Jennifer send that wonderful note, but she did send a gift. And considering that I have not had a mug for two, it's going to be two months now. Uh, I don't know, you know, drinking coffee. I'm sorry. Yeah, drinking coffee out of a Pilsner glass isn't quite fun. No. Um, Jennifer actually sent a mug, as you can see here. And Uh Danielle, on the front of that mug, it says, La Coochie, Florida. place. Yeah. So you may think that you won Danielle Hallen, but who has the Lacucci Florida mug? Oh, it's absolutely great. I love that so much. Oh my goodness. Oh, oh uh, please excuse me. I'm reaching for Lacucci. That's, that's all I can say. I'm telling you that you can't not see that or hear that or say that out loud without laughing. I think it's impossible. <laughs> Jennifer, you knocked it out of the park. I know. And, that was so great. Yeah. And she sent the mug to the right place because I need the mug. And yeah, we're both winners this month, Danielle. That's <laughs> that's how it works out. La Coochie, Florida. I have to visit there now. I know. I know. I need, I need a t-shirt. <laughs> I need a t-shirt to match my mug. Okay. Uh, so today we are covering another topic that many of you have suggested for a long time, and that is criminal cops. Now... We prepared these stories before the recent controversy here in Minneapolis with the George Floyd case. And personally, and I know Danielle agrees with this, I think it'd be irresponsible to not touch on that tragedy. Um, It's only happened a few days ago as of when we're recording this. There's a lot of information that's still coming out. So we don't have the full story, but I kind of feel like we have enough of the story to, to certainly talk about it a little bit. So we will do that later in today's episode. Uh, but please know that, of course, we are respectful to what's going on there. We do want to talk to you guys about it, but we also want to keep this an episode of Crime After Crime. So we're going to try to do it all. And by starting, we're going to go through the stories that we did originally prepare for today's episode. Now, we give a lot of authority and power to our law enforcement, and while many of them use both effectively to help keep our streets safe, some cops do turn criminal. For example, we now know that the Golden State Killer was a former police officer. Today, we're bringing you two stories about criminal cops, and we're going to start with the lovely and talented Danielle Hallen. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I've got to keep this running. Now... (laughs) We naturally think, like John said, that, you know, cops are there to fight the crime and not be the criminal themselves. But there was actually a study conducted at Bowling Green State University that told a little bit of a different story. It took a look at how often cops are arrested and the most common crimes they commit. They found that between the years of, I have 2005 and 2011, and I'm pretty sure John will actually mention 
another another statistic at the end of this that goes through 2014. Mm -hmm. um, but between that time period, there were 6,724 cases involving 5,545 police officers. Now, while that number obviously in itself is unsettling, what was kind of more unsettling, in my opinion, was that 40 percent. So almost half of those crimes occurred while the officer was on duty. Now, researchers also found that the officers only lost their job about half of the time. And, you know, this kind of makes sense because in two thirds of all of those cases, the cop in question was arrested by a different police department. So mm. their own department was unaware of their crimes because of a lack of communication. The cop I will be speaking about today pretty much fits into every single one of those categories, committing a crime while on duty, lack of communication, and he left a path of destruction in his path that changed lives forever. Now, Zach West Wester, pronounce his last name wrong already, Zach <laughs> Wester was 26 years old and working as a deputy for Jackson County in Florida. He seemed like a great police officer that took his job very seriously. After all, his father had also been a Jackson County deputy as well as a drug task force member. Zach had been working with the department for around two years. He had made well over 100 arrests. And while that may seem like he's just really great at his job, the local DA, along with other public defenders, noticed something about his arrests were never quite right. As cases would come through the court system, they noticed that it was a lot of drug arrests. More times than not, when a new drug case came through, Zach's name was on it. And I know there was a quote there where they said they were exaggerating, but it felt like over half the time. That's wow. a lot. Yeah. But while all of the public defenders knew that this was suspicious, nobody did much about it at all until May of 2018, when a woman named Christina Pumphrey was hired as an assistant state attorney. Now, Christina also noticed the very high number of drug arrests that all had Zach's name on them, and she began to ask questions. And the lawyers that she spoke with that had worked some of these cases told her that all of their clients always said the drugs were not theirs. Now, I know all of you right now are probably doing exactly what most people do when you hear this. You're rolling your eyes and saying, yeah, I heard that before. Yeah. But these clients didn't just say the drugs were not theirs. Almost all of them claimed they believed the drugs had been planted. Uh -oh. That's not something you do. To, that's not something you typically hear very often. Naturally, Christina was interested in the body cam footage from Zach that was captured during these arrests. And what she found was shocking. All of the detailed affidavits were not at all matching up with what was happening on the body cam footage. Zach would pull someone over for a very simple traffic violation, but almost always he wanted to search the car and it typically was not warranted. He would randomly claim he smelled marijuana and asked to search their car. And then he would have the driver stand far away from the vehicle so they couldn't closely monitor what he was doing. And as if illegally searching someone's car wasn't enough, Zach did something else strange while doing it. Usually the start of the search was always captured on his body cam. But then, all of you guys are about to laugh, all of a sudden, Zach would turn the body cam off. And I bet you're wondering what's happening when the body cam comes back on. Magically, meth would appear. Oh, no. When Zach would then confront the driver about the drugs found in their vehicle, they also had a very unusual reaction that was surprising to Christina. Pure confusion. And I feel like if you've watched any sort of situation like this unfold, you can tell when someone's being genuine and when they're just like, oh, that's not mine. What are you talking about? Yeah. But all of them were just, I mean, jaw to the floor, shocked. Christina realized that it was very likely that Zach was planting these drugs and framing innocent people. How do you go from, you know, pulling over a car for a simple traffic violation from to then smelling marijuana and then all of a sudden you're consistently finding meth after smelling marijuana in all these cars. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. She took this information and the evidence that she had found in hopes that the cases would be dismissed and an investigation into Zach would begin. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. Christina was repeatedly told to not worry about it and was given strict instructions to not dismiss any of the current cases. Christina was devastated. She felt like the justice system was failing and she was being forced to prosecute cases that had fabricated evidence. You know, she's literally being, it's terrible. I can't even imagine what that felt like. Yeah. You know, possibly innocent people were sitting in jail or, you know, awaiting trial out on bond and evidence that may prove their innocence was being swept under the rug. So she decided to take things into her own hands. She began to really, really dig through Zach's arrests and stumbled upon a woman named Teresa Odom. 
She was originally pulled over in February of 2018 because she had a brake light out. But just as Zach had done to many others, her vehicle was searched and meth was found. Christina went to review the body cam footage, and this time she was the one that found something huge. While Zach was searching the vehicle, his body cam was on and both of his hands were very visible. And in his left hand, there was a small white bag. And this was before he even claimed to have found the drugs. A Mm. bag resembling the meth that he claimed to have found in Teresa's vehicle. So Christina then compiled all of this evidence and everything else that she had found against Zach and brought it to the Jackson County Sheriff's Office, hoping someone would finally listen. Because at this point, it's not just a bad gut feeling of, wow, this is an odd pattern. She now has a video that shows a white baggie in his hand. Yeah. Sure enough, by August of 2018, an investigation was opened to take a deeper look into Zach's potential misconduct. It didn't take long at all for evidence to pile up. Because of the suspicious actions by Zach during the searches and the fact that majority of the searches were actually illegal, his patrol car was seized and searched and he was suspended. In the trunk of his patrol car, there was an unsecured bag of evidence that was very obviously personal use. It was not being handled in a way you would typically handle an evidence bag properly. Inside of this bag were five small bags of marijuana, 42 drug paraphernalia items, and 10 bags of meth. All of the items that he typically would find during all of these traffic stops. Once those items were compared to evidence taken from the drug arrest he was so notorious for, it was found they were all consistent in packaging and appearance. By September, Zach was fully fired. Now, as if that is not absolutely devastating enough, unfortunately, this wasn't even his first run-in with issues on the job. He'd previously worked for Liberty County Sheriff's Office starting in 2013, but that job ended very badly in 2016. This was the first job he got as an officer after quitting his job as a car salesman. Salesman. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And he was trying to follow in his father's footsteps. Uh, In Liberty County, Zach left because they found he was having inappropriate relationships with many women. And this apparently started almost immediately after he was hired. And it did occasionally occur while he was on duty. He was accused of having an affair with a co-worker's wife. He then proceeded to show pictures of her and brag about it while at work. He ended up in some sort of relationship with a woman after he arrested her for shoplifting. And the only reason anyone found out about that is because the woman's boyfriend found out and called into the sheriff's department to report it. He was also reported by a woman who said he made unwanted advances on her during a call. And I think this was some sort of robbery and she was very shaken up and he took it upon himself to hit on her. Oh my God. Yeah. And one of the worst parts about this is that Liberty County let Zach quit. They did not fire him. Mm. They did not label it as misconduct or that there had been any issues with his behavior. The one thing they did do, which, you know, you'd think this is an upside of it. They warned Jackson County. But guess what? (laughs) Because his father had been in the department and none of his records show that there was any sort of issue, it was overlooked. This was an absolute disaster. Someone known for misconduct was allowed to continue abusing his powers. And he, you know, immediately started abusing these powers the second he was allowed any powers to begin with. And the reality of it was that if Zach had been fabricating evidence at random minor traffic stops for at least the two years he'd been in Jackson County, First of all, he'd been putting innocent people in jail. And also, there's no telling if he had been doing this since he worked in Liberty County. So that means 2013 through 2018. Yeah. Authorities sat down to go through his cases and review evidence. Over 100 people, so the majority, literally almost all of his arrests, were either still out on bond or they had been still sitting in jail because they had previous charges or had, you know, broken probation. Mm -hmm. By late September, 119 cases were dropped. All of the cases because of Zach's testimony about discovering these drugs. And to make it worse, he clearly had some sort of a pattern every once in a while. 
Uh, majority of those that he planted drugs on had a prior record so that it was more likely it wouldn't be questioned. And they usually didn't have the option to be released on any sort of bond. They were also people that struggled with money or keeping work. He was essentially finding things out about these individuals very quickly to target his victims in a way that he knew he couldn't lose. But they're unfortunately not like it's better either way. There were still those that had absolutely no record. They'd never touched drugs in their lives. They were moms or, you know, dads or sisters or, you know, just average everyday people who had their whole lives uprooted by his actions. Many of Zach's victims that had been freed of false charges filed federal lawsuits against Zach, other officers, the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. They said that their civil rights were violated. They were wrongfully searched, wrongfully detained, wrongfully incarcerated. They were asking $74,000 in damage for what they had to go through. 37 more people filed against Zach at the state level, and the number just continues to grow still. And as of 2019, 263 cases are still under review. There were some that were found with a mass amount of drugs as well, making the charges much worse. There was one man in particular, he had actually recently been released from prison. Um, you know, he was getting his life on track. He had a job. He had just gained, um, or no. Yeah, no, he, he had just literally gotten out and they planted meth in his vehicle and he managed somehow to get out on bond. And within a week, Zach and another police officer pulled him over and planted more. Mm, I mean, they literally planted this on him. You know, terrible. these people have lost their jobs from sitting in jail because they either couldn't make bond or weren't given the option. Some were even forced into rehab for drug addictions that they didn't have. They faced humiliation when their names were thrown all across the news. One man even lost custody of his child. Um, you know, and even if those charges are dropped, they still technically remained on their record. They lost months, if not years of their life. And, you know, also have to deal with whatever the after effects would be. There was one couple that was pulled over with their children in the back seat. Excedrin was visible, a bottle of Excedrin and Zach saw it as an opportunity. This is, this is kind of like how he acted it out. He acted on a whim. He didn't plan majority of this. He told them a canine unit was coming. He planted meth in the bottle. He even pulled the woman's husband aside and said, Hey, I can tell that your wife uses meth because of how her face looks. Mm. And then he had the nerve to stop this man again months later, asking him where his wife was. It was a disaster. He affected lives so terribly. And Christina actually ended up resigning and she filed a lawsuit against the state attorney's office because after she took that final bit of evidence to the sheriff's department, she was called by a chief assistant state attorney named Larry Basford and he lost it on her. He told her that she had no business taking any of that information to authorities. He didn't understand why she thought it was her job to look into any of it anyways. He kept saying, you know, why would you even look into this case? Why would you look into this footage? Why would you even look into Zach? Basically, he knew how bad it made them look and he lashed out as hard as he possibly could on her. I've seen quotes on articles all over online and the things that they say about this woman are absolutely horrific. You can tell there's like this anger undertone to it. Just this it's like they, something's been taken from them. They said that she defied direct orders to not dismiss cases and essentially basically turned the spotlight onto her in hopes of taking it off of themselves and tried to make her feel like she had done something wrong. But she repeatedly said, you know, she, if she did that, if she continued working these cases, prosecuting these cases that she knew could potentially have fabricated evidence, she would be just as bad as Zach is. It's insane. Zach, I'm telling you. And they pushed her so hard to do it. And they've come out a handful of times and said that they never, like, were sweeping anything under the rug. They were never trying to hide anything. Um, I know that someone that she worked for, someone she was under, sent out a very detailed letter right before all of this happened saying that, you know, she was dismissing these cases that she wasn't supposed to be because she'd been directed not to. And they're like, oh, well, she just, you know, she did things wrong. She's the one who's doing things wrong. You know, yeah. totally taking away the fact that she had gone multiple times to them with issues. You know, and she had this phone call where they're yelling at her. Um, but Zach ended up being charged with 52 counts of racketeering, false imprisonment, 
official misconduct, fabrication of evidence, and possession of controlled substances. And he's facing up to 30 years in prison. Now, I don't think he's even gone to trial yet with all of this. A lot of things have been suspended, so it should be coming up soon. Yeah. Um, and the lawsuits are still up in the air as well, but I sure hope every single one of these victims get exactly what they ask for. And I think the most frustrating thing about this entire situation to me is why? You know, what was he going to gain from this? Did he do it to up his numbers so it looked better? Did he do it to maybe live up to his dad that was in the drug task force? Is that maybe a goal he had and he figured if he caught everyone with drugs, he'd get there? Or did he just do it because he could? You know, either way, per he ruined lives permanently. And it's scary to me that it took one woman standing up against everyone and being bashed by so many people in order to save these people, hundreds of people that he potentially wrongfully charged and put in prison. Yeah, it's that's a really heartbreaking aspect to this story. Um, and even with what we're going through right now in, in terms of the George Floyd case is yeah. uh, the administrations need to do the right thing in these cases yep. so that we don't all lose our faith in what they're doing. And exactly. You know, and when you see administration, there's I've I've kind of bumped up against administrations in my previous employment and other administrations where there is a self preservation mm -hmm. for these large administrations that is so important that they will effectively not do the right thing. They'll kind of take the easier choice just to make the problem go away, which yep. is kind of what you have happen in the first county where they're kind of like, you, you know, they sat him down and they said, hey, we, we figured out what's going on here, but mm -hmm. tell you what, you can either quit or we can make this look a lot worse and you'll never work as a cop again. Yeah. And at that point, even that is not a great decision because by doing that, they didn't lay out the trail, the paper trail that you would effectively need to follow him into mm -hmm. that next job and maybe have that be identified faster. Yeah. Uh, or, or maybe he should have never had another job. But because they opted for kind of the easier choice of let's let him quit, let's let's not press this. Well, um, it's, it's just it's sad to me because it's like he's he still had victims in the first county. It was just kind of a different way. And again, we don't know if he continued this then. I don't know if they've been digging any deeper to see, but you know, he's yeah. approaching these women in a very inappropriate manner. And it's like by showing him that it's okay to ignore that and to, you know, take things the easy way because that would be difficult. They're giving him a green card to keep going. Yeah. And you know, here, you, like that just creates more victims. When you do things like that, you are allowing there to be, more victims and it absolutely drives me insane absolutely. the good thing right now <clears throat> is that it is publicly known that exactly. there are articles being written about this and more importantly that there's lawyers that are working with some of these victims because yeah. those lawyers are going to be putting out messages to try to get to the other victims and they're going to try to make these trials even bigger and get more people involved oh. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they've already stated they are not giving him any sort of plea deal, period. Like yeah. point blank, he's not getting a single thing from them. And, you know, it comes back down to as well, what you were speaking about before is about the administrations. They need to do better and they need to, you know, because the fact that she was able to bring up his name one time and every lawyer was like, oh, Zach, like that, Zach. They mm -hmm. these lawyers are the ones who told her to go and look at the footage. They were the ones yeah. who told her to look at the footage and compare it to the affidavits. They all knew. Down, they knew everything that she knew, and they didn't do anything about it. And these are, you know, people that are supposed to be, I don't know, it, I'm telling you, drives me absolutely insane. And it also makes me question, because I didn't see a lot of details, but I know that other officers are being charged. I do know that there was the one who was with Zach when he planted meth on that one man for the second time, but I don't, I don't know how deep their involvement was, but it's like, there's no telling how far that can run. What if he showed people how easy that was and then they are doing it as well. But yeah. then once he took the rap for it, they like clean their act up real quick so that they can't be caught. There could be so many other people. You raise a really good question, though, in terms of the why, because if yeah. this is a situation where he's like trying to fake it till he makes it, you never make it. 
no. ultimately you wind up faking a talent that you don't really have being put into a position where you're not capable because you don't have the talent for that position. Yep. At some point that house of cards is going to come crumbling down. So yeah, it really makes you wonder, was he just looking for easy numbers or if this was a promotion that was never going to work out right? No. Um, but it's, it's strange because the, the aspect, the motivation, the intent is definitely yeah. not clear here. I don't, I don't know why he was doing that. And that's what I kept looking for the entire time I was researching. I just kept asking myself, why was he doing this? Like what? I can't wait to hear what his reasoning is behind this for, cause this is ridiculous and yeah. never found it. Yeah. Didn't find it at all. Yeah. Um, and quickly, I want to say a thank you to mypanhandle.com, Tallahassee.com, the Washington Post, and appeal.org. There was a lot of information about this case, um, and I think they did it perfectly. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I think you did a great job telling us about this case, and it just um, it, it leaves me with a, an un unsettled feeling yeah. about mm -hmm. what is going on with everything here. And um, I get that feeling in a lot of different cases that we look into that kind of have this same type of issue happening, you know, people that yeah. we trust mm -hmm. not doing the right thing. That's like 400 cases that they have in question total. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That makes my skin crawl. That's a lot of lives mm -hmm. potentially ruined. Yep. So yeah. Well, that is one of the criminal mm -hmm. cops case. And in a typical trend that happens here on the channel, my case kind of lines up with yours a little bit. We, we see that happen every now and then here. Mind readers. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, we will be back to get to that case right after this short break. Mint Mobile has figured out the future of wireless cell phone service. Are you still paying inflated prices and hidden fees to one of those big guys when you could be paying just 15 bucks a month with Mint Mobile? Stop it! With Mint Mobile, you get great network coverage at literally a fraction of the cost. The activation process is easy with just a few minutes of your time. You can save literally hundreds of dollars a year. I tried two phones side by side, one on my old service and one on Mint Mobile. The connection strength, sound quality, and even internet speeds were identical. They keep their costs down by handling everything online and then pass the savings on to you. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. Don't pay for unlimited data you're not using. Find the perfect size data plan. Choose between three, eight, or 12 gigabytes of 4G LTE data. The average American only uses four to five gigs monthly. You can bring your old phone number over to Mint Mobile. You can even check to see if your current phone is compatible with their service with just a quick stop at their website. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. That's mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. Ditch your old wireless bill and start saving with Mint Mobile. Welcome back and please support these amazing companies that believe in crime after crime. Absolutely. Big thank you to Mint mm -hmm. Mobile. We love you guys. I love the service. I'm still using it. All right. You ready? I I'm, sure uh, am. Shaking out the kinks here. Let's see if we can <laughs> learn about another criminal cop. Danielle, the story I'm about to tell you is frequent, frequently referred to as uh, the NYPD's most corrupt cop. Honestly, that kind of scares me. <laughs> I can only imagine where that's going to go. Oh, well, here we go. Let's let's see what happens. Uh, New York City was a very different place in the 1980s. The city was actually nearly bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Residents were moving out and crime was moving in. But like adding gas to a flame, things shifted into a whole different gear with the arrival of crack cocaine. A crystallized form of cocaine that can be smoked it offers a short but very intense high and is one of the most addictive forms of cocaine. It was the perfect product for criminals looking to turn junkies into gold mines. Crack cocaine was literally eating up New York City, criminals were profiting from it, and cops were trying to control as much of the damage as possible. Well, most cops, that is. Uh -oh. Michael Dowd was born on January 10th, 1961 in Brooklyn, New York. 
He was the third in a group of seven children. His father was a firefighter and his mother a homemaker. They lived in a neighborhood primarily occupied by families of law enforcement and other firefighters in Brentwood, Long Island. His father, Jack, thought that Michael was a bright star on the horizon of life. According to Michael, he was a good student, but when he got out of school, decided he would apply to both the police department as well as the firefighters department. He tested for both, but in his own words, the police test came back first. Simple as that. Okay. Dowd got out of... Yeah, it's it's easy. Uh, Dowd got out of the police academy and was on the streets of the 75th precinct by 1982. The 7-5, as it's often referred to, was no joke even before the crack epidemic. They had 100 murders in one year in just the five square mile area that was covered by the 75th precinct. Only the Bronx had more murders at that time. That's terrifying. I would never, ever leave my home. It was, I mean, I, I never, I was way too young to actually travel to New York at that time, but the coverage that you would see like in news stories and everything, I mean, uh, kind of imagine Gotham City in yeah. terms of how, and Batman, it, it was like, it was real. Like New York was dark. There was a lot of really bad things going on there That's back at that time. Absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Uh, Michael Dowd was what most people would consider a clean cop for about a year. No, no. One of his earlier instances of bending the law was reportedly him stealing food from a church, food that was meant to feed the hungry. Interestingly, his 1987 performance evaluation described him as an officer with excellent street knowledge who is empathetic to the community and has good career potential. Empathetic wow. to the community. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> With good career potential, too. Yeah. Which, uh, that's certainly one way of putting it. Uh, he did see some career potential uh, in his own words. Here's a quote from him. They were selling drugs on my street. If you're going to make money on my corner, I'm going to make money, too, either with you or against you. Wait, that, did what? That, yeah. Did that sound like a police officer or did that sound like a gangland thug? <laughs> yes, it does. I wouldn't. That's I don't even. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Uh, Michael was frequently voicing during that time that the NYPD did not want police officers making narcotics arrests. He was saying that it was too expensive to process the arrests and the ensuing legal charges. He states that cops were actually being dissuaded from making those types of arrests by their superiors. While working the streets, Dowd was assigned a partner named Kenny Ural. Uh, also initially a clean cop, Kenny would learn about how Michael was handling crime scenes they would find, taking drugs and money from the places they were raiding. They were quickly becoming the types of guys they were paid to put away. Michael and Kenny would even use the equipment and training given to them by the police department to conduct crimes. Police department raid gear and tactics were now being used for armed robberies and intimidation of stores that were competing with the drug dealers that Michael and Kenny were working with. Whenever drug traffickers needed guns or badges, they knew exactly who to go to. No. Oh, oh yeah. man. <laughs> these, these guys went all out. And Michael Dowd yeah. was really the lead man. He got fully <laughs> into it. Uh, he also enlisted other officers as well, and he put a crew together that was basically working on these criminal activities while they were wearing a badge. There was a very close call in 1986 when 13 cops were arrested in the neighboring 77th precinct and charged with corruption. Some of Dowd's crew thought the hammer would soon swing in their direction, so they resigned, but not Michael. He figured the NYPD was now looking really bad in the public's eye, and they wouldn't risk exposing another similar scandal, even if they did know what was going on. Ooh, it's kind of like gross how right that is, though. It, it, uh, it ties into what you're talking about, too, with yeah. the administrations like just, oh, we know something bad's going on there. Nope, we can't address that. Nope, yeah. we don't want to see it. Um, another thing, which I don't think I really worked into this too much, there was regular complaints coming in about this guy. I mean, he's, oh my gosh. he's conducting criminal activity. So, of course, people are noticing what's yeah. happening to those complaints not being processed. Nope. No investigations being conducted. Nope. Victims that are looking for justice. Just nope. Never, never getting any help. But he figures that, hey, no one's going to come looking for us now because we had this neighboring precinct that was busted. It's safer than ever. And he starts considering himself untouchable. Oh, boy. 
And for several more years, it kind of seemed like that was the case. In an effort to stabilize his extracurricular income, Dowd brokered an unthinkable deal. He got in contact with a local drug dealer named Adam Diaz and made him an offer. For $24,000 down and $8,000 a week, Dowd would tip Diaz off to any raids and help protect his drug empire from the authorities and other competitors. Diaz agreed and the money started flowing in. This new racket was so successful, Dowd started forgetting to pick up his $600 a week paychecks from the police department. He had trunks of cash. What, what's he yeah. going to worry about that paycheck for? Oh my gosh. Dowd and Ural even set up some drug dealers of their own. They had one in particular named Harry that worked out of neighboring Suffolk County where they lived. The life of excess was going faster and faster and the control that Dowd once had was slipping. Mm -hmm. Quote, my wife kept telling me to stop, but I couldn't stop. I loved the extra money so much and I spent it very openly. He was getting sloppy, caring less and less about being caught. He drove an expensive red Corvette to work, owned four homes and a condo, and took constant trips, usually with limousines arriving to pick him up. He began using the drugs he was selling, even doing coke off the dashboard of his squad car and drinking on and off the job. But their little drug dealer on the side, Harry, had become a target of the Suffolk County police. When they raided a house Harry was frequenting, they found a drug den and Michael Dowd's partner, Kenny Ural. Oh, no. Oh. Dowd explains that the day, that day where it all went down, he felt yeah. like he was being followed. He was seeing cars and he thought that there was undercover agents at every turn. Was it the co the cocaine and alcohol or m maybe the anxiety of this crazy life he had put together? Oh, gosh. <laughs> nope. Internal affairs was on to him and they literally came in behind him as he returned to the police station. He was ordered to take a drug test. Dowd thought this was the end of all the craziness. And for a moment, he actually felt relieved. But. It didn't last long. Suffolk County officers arrested him and found something on him while patting him down. Another quote from him. I'm half drunk and high. They empty my pockets and find the cocaine. The guy looks at me and I say, I got a little problem, I guess. I still thought I could fix it. I still thought I could win. That scares me so bad. That's it's, such a scary mentality to literally feel like because you've been given this power that you are untouchable, you are above the law and you can get your way out of anything. Absolutely. Absolutely above the law. And I don't know what type of ego this guy had before several yeah. years of this lifestyle, but no doubt several years of this lifestyle just blew it up and blew it up to this point where he's like, Yeah, where hey, someone pulls cocaine out and then you're just like, oh, I can fix this problem. <laughs> yeah, I can fix that. I can take care of that. Um, so, you know, he's getting arrested. They find the cocaine. Uh, mm -hmm. Believe it or not, he comes up with another big scheme that he thinks will get him free and clear of all of his problems. So Dowd and Ural are released on bail. Dowd came up with a plan to kidnap the wife of a man who stole about $200,000 worth of cocaine from drug dealers. Those drug dealers put a bounty on the guy's wife's head and she happened to live in Queens. So Dowd figures if him and his buddy Ural could pull off kidnapping her and then, you know, just hand her over to the drug dealers for execution. It's a little extreme. Yeah. Then a uh, extreme. he'll take the bounty. He'll take his cut of the money and he'll take off to, to uh, Nicaragua and just never look back. At really? The US. Re yeah. Really realistic plan right there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going <laughs> to, hey, this okay. one deal. We'll get this woman, hand her off to be killed. Give me some money. We'll I'm going to take Nicaragua. off to another country. Yeah. That's it. Nicaragua for the rest of my life. Uh, Ural knew something that Dowd didn't. Okay. The FBI was all over Diaz and they had tape of the three of them collaborating on their crimes. These guys were now looking at trouble on a federal level and Ural wasn't interested in going down like that. Before he and Dowd were released on bail, he agreed to help the FBI by wearing a wire. I knew that was going to happen. I had a feeling he was going to be the one to be like, eh. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. Your story has a hero. This yeah. one is kind of tough because this is this is a pretty dark hero, but this is a guy that kind of decides he's going to do the right thing. Yeah. Is it because he's really a good guy or because he's just covering himself? I don't know. But uh, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, he decides he's going to wear a wire. The whole Colombian wife kidnapping plot was recorded on tape. That tape was now in the hands of the <gasps> FBI. Just hours prior to when the kidnapping was to occur, federal agents rescued the woman. Dowd initially thought that the drug traffickers had possibly set a trap for him, but he also began considering that his partner might be involved in something here. Oh, no. The answer was clear when Michael went home and federal agents, as well as NYPD officers, were waiting there for him. So he's now arrested. He's got charges. But guess what, Danielle? No, no, he does not. <laughs> this he guy doesn't. doesn't quit. While he's jailed and going through his trial, he would once again demonstrate that maybe he wasn't learning his life lessons very well. He was writing letters to a drug dealer from his federal detention cell in Manhattan. That drug dealer was turning the letters into the authorities to lessen charges that they had against him. Well, you know what? When you think you're untouchable, all these people that you might have screwed over can be like, not so much. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and look at this trend now. It's like yeah. everyone protecting themselves. You know, exactly. like his, his partner finds a way to protect mm -hmm. himself. This drug dealer, hey, I can use this situation to ease up what's going on with me. Michael Dowd would eventually have his day in court. He made a statement before his sentence, his sentencing about being caught between his career and his drug addiction. One day I was driving to work and I was having a heart attack, I thought. Rather than go for help, I pulled off to the side of the road so I wouldn't crash and waited for the pains to subside. That night, I did cocaine again. His play at sympathy from the court didn't seem to help much. During sentencing, Judge Wood told Mr. Dowd that his crimes betray an immorality so deep that it is rarely encountered. You did not just fall prey to temptation and steal what was in front of you or take kickbacks or sell confidential law enforcement information. You also continually search for new ways to abuse your position. And at times you recruited fellow officers to join in on your crimes. After a police career that involved drug dealing, armed robberies, tipping off criminal organizations, stealing from crime scenes, racketeering and using and selling vast amounts of cocaine, Michael Dowd would wind up getting almost the maximum sentence, 14 years with parole eligibility after serving 11. He would wind up actually serving 12 and a half years in prison. He says during that time, he worked as a peer counselor, ran the addiction and suicide prevention programs, worked out a lot and read a lot of books. His partner, Ural, didn't spend one day in jail. Wow. Wow. Now, what do you think, Danielle? Seeing this guy's character so far, do you think that he learns anything at this point? I'm going to have to go with no. <laughs> just, you know, for the obvious reasons that he just, even when being caught multiple times and while in jail, was like, eh. Let's just yeah. keep trying. <laughs> just keep trying. Keep trying. Um, well, in a recent interview with Daily Mail, Dowd recalled his past saying, life was wonderful. Wonderful, sinful, and glorious. I felt like Scarface, only I was a white Irish boy from Long Island. <laughs> now, he was so bad, he actually inspired something big to happen. And maybe we need more things like this to happen. Uh, Mayor David Dinkins would start an effort to find and end police corruption called the Mullen Commission. Michael Dowd provided information to help them understand how these types of crimes were occurring and was one of the main reasons they decided to start this initiative in the first place. The Mullen Commission reported that the police department was failing to ensure the honesty of its members for almost a decade. Their Internal Affairs Division didn't investigate numerous complaints against Michael Dowd, enabling him to continue with his crimes, and the commission came up with more than 100 changes in police department procedures to curb further abuse. That's a lot of changes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I'm giving a really brief overview. I mean, they started yeah. a lot, um, independent review organizations and some other things that really tried to help uh, combat that. Now out of prison, can a formerly crooked cop straighten out? In an interview in 2015, Dowd says that he's been sober for the most part since 1992. 
According to a report from Newsday, his website stated that Michael Dowd reinvented himself as a consultant who discusses the ethics of policing, police corruption and misconduct, and the understanding of the blue code. Other information I found points to different business ventures. In an interview with nymag.com, he stated, I just started a job eight months ago, my first real full-time job. It was very difficult to start all over again. I'm a licensed New York City refrigeration engineer, and I'm working in a hospital in the mechanical engineering division. To hear he's working in a hospital, the only thing I can say is keep him away from the pharmacy. I was about to say, I, why do I feel like this is just like the same thing happening all over again? <laughs> uh, in Makes 2016, Dowd decided he wanted to start a new business venture with an old friend, Former drug dealer Adam Diaz, who now lives in the Dominican Republic, and Michael Dowd started a cigar line, and they decided to call it the 7-5. On the cigar box is written, nobody can touch me, nobody can touch my crew. And in another spot, it says the King of Brooklyn. Many people consider it a disgrace to the precinct. Some believe drug dealers are likely the only friends that Dowd has left. Others say he should donate all the proceeds to the NYPD Widows and Children's Fund. Michael Dowd hasn't quite been able to keep himself out of trouble. Near the end of 2016, he would be arrested on domestic violence charges. In 2017, Dowd would be charged with violating a protection order. Oh, boy. When asked by TheFix.com about cops with ethics and if he thought they were saps or rats, Dowd answered, look, most cops want to be good cops, including myself. It depends on the environment they're in and where the gray line is. I didn't want to be a gangster, but once you cross the line, it's very difficult to get back. Wow. Uh, Danielle, there's an amazing documentary on this. It's called yeah. The Seven Five. There's also a book co-authored by Kenny Ural called Betrayal in Blue. And if you're wondering how Kenny and Michael may be getting along these days, here's a little interesting anecdote for you. <laughs> Uh, Sony has been developing a feature film about all of this, and Michael Dowd was asked if he could cast himself and his partner, Kenny, in the new feature film, who would play them. He responded, I don't know who could play my partner. There's got to be somebody with a little rat on their head. Ryan Gosling for me, but for him, it'll have to be some squealy-nosed little prick. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I think he might still be like a little bit upset. You think? <laughs> I, I did see that, you know, around some press events they had for the 7-5, they actually did have both these guys get back together again, for, like for little Q&As Q and, and yeah. stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I think there's still some tough feelings there. Uh, thank you, New York Times, Newsday, New York Magazine, Vice, Daily Mail, Reason.com, ProPublica.org, TheFix.com, Patch.com, and Wikipedia for information contributing to today's story. Honestly, I I don't know how to feel about Ural. I feel the fact that he didn't go to jail at all doesn't. I mean, I get that he ratted him out, but he also played a big part in that. Yeah, yeah, I have some mixed feelings about it too. And to, um, me, to me, that kind of still gives everyone the idea, like that. To me, that they're still doing exactly what the problem is when they when that happened. You know, saying eh, yeah, yeah, well, but you, I guess, are above it. Right, right. Just to say, just because you're the first guy to roll on the situation, yeah. does that really make you innocent? And I don't think it does. No, um, not at all. But it, it's interesting. You know, you get if if you watch the seven five, um, yeah. you'll get a good sense of their personalities. And Michael is just he's so over the top. I can he's see such that. he's a gangster. Yeah. Like, and even now that he's out of that, there's a lot of interviews you can find of him. He just, he loves to speak and it just, it seems like he's not always thinking about what he's saying. He just lets things fly. I mean, he's, yeah. he's kind of an open book, but not in a way where you're kind of appreciative of it. Like he just, he really lets stuff go. Kenny is a bit different and you do get this kind of strange feeling even when you see him interviewed of like, is this someone I would really trust at any point? Yeah. Like yeah. these are, these are guys that did really, really terrible things mm -hmm. and yeah, things fell a certain direction, but I don't know. It could have just as easily gone the other way. You know, Michael could have rolled first on Kenny, and I would yeah. still consider them both very, very similar. Exactly. Um, so we do have other stories we want to talk about. Um, 
And of course, uh, if we want to talk about what's happening this week as well. Some of Michael Dowd's comments kind of relate a little bit to what's happening this week. So I wanted to share those with you guys. Um, he had an interview with nymag.com about the current public perception of police officers. And here's what Michael Dowd said. Police behavior that is inappropriate is inappropriate. There is no excuse for it. The other thing I like to point out is this. We are asking human beings who are filled with emotion and fear and personal anxieties to do a job that sometimes requires a robot. A cop is a hero when he risks his emotions and his feelings and his life to save someone else's life. But a cop is a bad guy when his emotions get away from him. And of course, this is really making me think about the George Floyd situation. Yeah. Um, right now, many Minnesotans and people all around the country and even the world are very upset with what happened a few days ago. An African-American man was killed um, seemingly by a white officer when restraining him using a knee on his neck for several minutes. Uh, this literally only happened a few days before yeah. we're recording this. The details are still coming in. Um, the official story was that they restrained him and then they called for medical services and then he dies at the hospital. I don't know if that's going to change as more details come out. Um, the original call, just so you guys know, was for a forgery in progress. There was a local business that said he was trying to pass off some bad papers or something. Yeah. Um, police showed up and according to their version of events, they see him in his car. It looks like he's intoxicated. They try to get him out and he starts fighting them or there's some type of resistance. And that's how all this goes down. Uh, I'm, I'm watching news on this like up to the minute. And we're literally starting to hear things that there's other footage from other local businesses. They're saying they don't see the resistance necessarily. This is a tough story on all fronts, but the restraint, um, the <sighs> thankfully a bystander was there. Yeah. Thankfully, mm -hmm. they recorded it happening. And that's honestly how a big chunk of the truth of this story came forward. Exactly. This, yeah, the simple version that was reported and then all of a sudden the video just kind of blowing that to the wayside is, is what happened. Yeah. But if you see any stills or if you watch the footage for yourself, um, that it's, restraining position just – I can't believe that's a real thing, that that's a legit restraint. I, I've looked into I, it. I was going to ask. I wasn't sure if that was something legitimate or not because when I saw that, it was shocking to me. It, I mean, I think maybe if you're – if there's someone who's very, very physically aggressive and you cannot detain them for a second just so someone could cut handcuffs on. But right. keeping someone in that position, why on earth would you do that? Yeah, and, and I, I agree with that. I think there might be some instance where, you know, depending on what's going on in the struggle and that's one of your only options and maybe you use that as a, a, a point of holding them while other controls come into place. But that's... That's, That's not like, what we're seeing in this footage where you've got several minutes of this cop staying in that position. Other police officers are on scene and no one's coming to change that situation. No, not at all. And you can very clearly tell that the police officer isn't even having to put effort into it. So it's not like he is like having to continuously fight this man down for his own safety or anyone else's safety. Yeah. He's quite casually just laying his knee on this man's neck. I mean, he he has like one hand on the car. The other one's just relaxing. Yeah. He's looking got, around. He's not even staying focused yeah. on him. And, and you have people like yelling at you. Hey, he yeah. can't breathe. He can't breathe. He's you know? yelling at you saying, I can't breathe. Yes. Yeah. And it raises another question for me. Um, to your point, they're... This is happening against the squad car mm -hmm. and is really keeping him in that pinned position safer than getting him back in the squad car. Which, you know, I, I watched them even, you know, grab him and put his hands behind his back. You can see that very clearly in the footage and he doesn't even, you know, you don't see him pull his hands away or anything. He They just easily grab his hands and put him behind his back. Granted, he, things could have changed that we just haven't seen, but I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, it's it's really a terrible thing, and um, we've been he also hearing some different stories. I've I've heard some quotes from the mayor. It sounds like all four officers might have been uh, fired. 
I'm hearing other reports that are saying, no, they were actually just pulled from duty. As of when we're recording this, I'm not exactly sure which way it's going. The last thing I saw was that they were just pulled from duty and they're still being paid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the FBI is investigating, but quite honestly, even that might not be the end of all this. Reason.com reported in January of 2020 that the worst cops in San Antonio, Texas usually get their jobs back thanks to the police union. They tell the story of Matthew Luckhurst of the SAPD who tried to feed a homeless man a sandwich made out of dog feces. He got his job back when the department couldn't prove the date of the incident in an arbitration hearing enforced by an agreement with the San Antonio Police Officers Association. You're joking. No, they, they couldn't pin the date. And that was basically the loophole to, well, then we're going to go ahead and have to drop this charge against him. And that's just infuriating because all I can think back to is all the different cases that I've looked into where, you know, oh man. Yeah. Like something like ugh, something like that wouldn't have mattered. Yeah. Out of 40 officers fired between 2010 and 2019, 27 have gotten their jobs back through that arbitration process with the police union in San Antonio. Is that going to happen here in Minneapolis? Um, I, I know I've already seen comments from the union basically saying that, you know, they're going to try to defend the officers to the best of their ability. Oh boy. Oh my goodness. Well, a former cop attorney and now professor of criminology, Philip Stinson, has created a police crime database. I think that's incredibly important. I stumbled across that multiple times while I was going through my own research. The numbers show that while the perception may be that police officers get away with crime, more than 8,000. So that number is up for my right. years. This is right. now from 2005 to 2014. Didn't. Most often, police officers are charged with simple assault, which sometimes includes their significant others, driving under the influence, and official misconduct or violation of oath. You can review that data for yourself at policecrime.bgsu.edu. There's even a way that you can check out your local state or county's information. And at least we're starting to hear some of that. And yeah. in both of today's stories, we had examples of kind of I don't. I, I even struggle calling them good outcomes, but at least outcomes where justice is arriving in one form or another. And yeah. thankfully, this database is showing that it does in some cases. Obviously, in other cases, it doesn't. The administrations swallow it up or cover it up or hide it. And yeah. we, we don't see what we should be seeing. Um, believe it or not, as bad as some of the stories that we've heard today are, ProPublica reports that in a village called Stebbins in Alaska, Every one of their seven cops has been convicted of domestic violence. Good grief. Is, isn't that unbelievable? That's incredible. First of all, they only have seven cops. And like the fact that all of them managed to be criminals in the exact same way. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, one officer hired on the same day he turned in his application was even a registered sex offender. And they hired him. Even the chief of police has a criminal record there. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, I do just want to put a reminder out there yeah. that I know this is an extremely tough job. I know that um, maybe there's certain situations you can't train for and Absolutely. strange things are going to happen. But I also have to believe that there's a better way of doing things. As I looked into the information about this particular restraint using a knee on someone, I did find that it is something that has been trained in the past, um, but isn't in current training, uh, at least here in Minnesota. And that's that's another thing that I was struggling yeah. with. You'll find in some states where they're like, oh yeah, we do train officers to do that. Other states, no, we haven't trained officers to do that since the 1970s. I think we really still have a problem with this country. And I've been talking about this since I started the True Crime Channel, that we have so many different processes running in all these different places some things have to be figured out as the best practices and those things have to be enforced globally or, yeah. or at least nationwide. I it just it doesn't agree. make sense to have all these bizarre variations and, hey, we're going to train them like this. No, we're not going to do that over in this state. Um, but, you know, I, I just I hope people really think about how we can end tragedies like we're seeing here in Minnesota this week. Absolutely. Oh, man, you guys, that was a lot of criminal cops. <laughs> it sure was. Yeah. Like a whole lot of them. Yeah. But you guys always get to vote every single month. 
who had the best criminal cop story. And uh, that's going to be a tough one. I think so. Yeah. I think this is another close call and we're tied. So it should be a close call, but uh, let's have the audience tell us. You can vote at the Twitter account, at Crime After Pod. It'll be posted there, and you can vote for seven days after the episode drops. Or you guys can also vote on YouTube. I'm going to get into something in a minute, but as of right now, until next month, you should be able to hover your mouse over or just click the screen. A little eye will appear in the corner. The poll will pop down. You choose who to cast your vote for. But you guys, unfortunately, and this is something that's made me so upset, next month this is going to change because YouTube is removing their polling card feature. Why, YouTube? Why are you doing this? I don't get it either. I feel like, first of all, that's just great for content creators in general to get feedback on things. But it was a huge, a huge portion of what we do. But do not worry. We've got something figured out. We will tell you guys more about it next month. So you are not going to lose your ability to vote. Don't panic like I did. I panicked for a minute, (laughs) (laughs) but we've got it figured out. Absolutely. And you will learn about that in next month's episode, which is solved by psychics. Now, Danielle, I have to say, I have been looking for stories of cases that were solved by psychics for a good long time. And I really struggle with it because I haven't found the case where I'm like, hey, hands down, this is the one. This definitively was solved by a psychic. I've seen some things where psychics have contributed information and that information turns out to be uh, info that is corroborated. Yeah. But I haven't, yeah, I, I haven't quite seen one where the information from the psychic causes a particular chain of events or gets them to a particular place. And that's really what I'm going to try to look for, at least in my research. What do you think about this one? Well, guess what, John? I might have a little trick up my sleeve. <gasps> I'm psychic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I actually already know a case and I have access to who, you know, had the information directly given to them by a psychic that helped solve a case. Oh, wow. I mean, it's some crazy stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my hardest to make it my story. I don't know if there's going to be enough information or if it might be too complicated. I only know bits and pieces, but this happened to someone close and I can speak to them about it. And it's someone that never, ever believed in psychics. And then this happened and they were like, wait a minute. I'm at least going to have it as an extra story, but I'm hoping it'll work out. All right. I might might change your mind. You might. You might make a believer out of me. We (laughs) will see next month. If you guys want to see more of John and I, you guys can follow us both on our YouTube channels or all over social media. All you have to do for me is search Daniel Hallen anywhere and I should pop up. Or search Lord and Arts and you will find me. If you have ideas for the show, please check out our new website, www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com. You can submit ideas there. Do all kinds of stuff there. We've got everything you need right there. You can even go to our Teespring store where you can be a winner every single month. And you can have your own Crime After Crime mug. But only I... (laughs) can have the lacucci the lacucci mug the lacucci mug <laughs> oh crime after crime is produced and hosted by daniel hallen and john lorden and we want to say a thank you to our patrons as always you guys are absolutely awesome we have so much fun with you every month we have a patreon special segment it's awesome and hilarious plus patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming patreon special as well If you enjoyed today's show, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell them about us. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime and they really need to check it out. Exactly. (laughs) Thank you guys so much. And we will see you next time.